In video 40 of Tensor Calculus, we're going to follow up our previous video by illustrating what the gradient looks like in each of our sample coordinate systems. We'll start with Cartesian coordinates. I've uh, written the expression for the gradient here at the top of the screen. And we can use either of these two forms. In Cartesian coordinates, we should get the same result. Uh, so let's just use this. And of course, um, the covariant derivative of a scalar function is nothing but the partial derivative. So this is just the partial of f with respect to z i times our z i contravariant basis vector. So let's just run through it. We start with the partial derivative of f with respect to z1, which is x, times the z1 basis vector, which is x hat. Then uh, the partial derivative of f with respect to z2, which is y, times the z2 contravariant basis vector, which is y hat. And then the partial derivative of f with respect to z3, which is z, times the corresponding contravariant basis vector. And with that, we're done. That is the expression for the gradient in Cartesian coordinates. Now, if you look at this particular form, you'll remember you start with uh, z, i, j. This is the contravariant derivative. z, i, j times the covariant derivative with respect to j. So this is just the partial of f with respect to z, j times the covariant basis vector, z, i. Now, in this case, these factors, the z, i, j factors, are just one all the way down the diagonal. So we only have to deal with three terms, and they're all uh, terms in which this component is one. So um, taking that into account, along with the fact that the contravariant basis vectors and the covariant basis vectors are identical, then these two expressions are the same. We're going to get this same result if we use this expression right over here. OK, um, before we leave, I want to point out how easy it would be to reverse engineer this result. Suppose I told you that this was the expression for the gradient in Cartesian coordinates, and you didn't know anything about the gradient. All you were told was this is the right answer for it. And I ask you to create a tensor calculus equation for it, uh, to create a tensor equation that uh, represents this. Well, look how easy it would be. We, first of all, would look at these things and realize that the partial derivatives in Cartesian coordinates equate to the covariant derivative in tensor calculus. So we'd replace these expressions with this. Then we have our basis vectors here. So you'd know to contract this with a set of basis vectors like this. And of course, you'd know you'd have to use the contravariant basis vectors with the covariant derivative because we have to form a contraction to make it an invariant expression. All right, well, once you've done that, then we um, would realize that we can flip-flop the indexes here. Uh, we can move this index up and this index down and get an alternate expression like this. So without knowing anything about the gradient, if I just told you this, you would be able to come up with a valid tensor equation in tensor calculus that uh, would work for all coordinate systems. OK, let's move on to affine coordinates. Here we'll just work through the result using our covariant basis. And to do that, let's expand out the full meaning of this expression. So uh, you remember the contravariant uh, derivative is really the contravariant metric tensor zij times the covariant derivative with respect to j. Well, that is just the partial derivative of our function f with respect to zj, and then multiplying by the 
covariate basis vector zi. Okay, so that's the full expanded meaning of this expression right here. So to get the result, we're going to have to walk through each of the components of our contravariant metric tensor, and that's these guys right here. Now, what I like to do is to use this form, because we can use this matrix that has no fractions in it, and when we're done, we simply multiply by this expression on the outside of the parentheses. Okay, so let's do it. We'll just walk our way through each of the four components. Z11 would be this B squared term. So that's B squared times the partial derivative of F with respect to Z1. Well, Z1 for affine coordinates is U. So this is the partial of F with respect to U. And then times Z1, which is our first basis vector. So that's our first term. Second term, we'll iterate j to 2. So we're dealing with z12. That's this term. That's negative a b cosine alpha. And then j is 2. So this is the partial derivative of f with respect to z2, which in affine coordinates is our variable v, like that. But i is still equal to 1, so this is going to be z1 here. Okay, now we iterate i to 2 and j back to 1. So z21 is this term here. Negative a b cosine alpha. Now j is 1, so this is going to be the partial of f with respect to u. And i is 2, so this is z2. Now the last term is uh, uh, i and j are both 2, so we're going to have a squared, that's this last term, times the partial of f with respect to z2, which is v, times our basis vector z2, like this. Okay, now I have to take all of this, and I have to multiply it, by this uh, factor out here. But uh, before we do that, I want to rearrange the terms a little bit. What I like to do is to group these uh, relative to the individual basis vectors. So let's uh, express it this way. We'd have b squared times the partial of times the partial of f with respect to u, taking the second term minus a, B, cosine alpha times the partial of F with respect to V, and then combine those and factor out the Z1 basis vector. Then we'll do something similar down here, but I want to reverse the terms. I just like things to look like a kind of a mirror image. So we'll write the second term first, partial of F with respect to U, uh, V rather, minus a b cosine alpha times the partial derivative of f with respect to u and all of that times the z2 basis vector. Now we can combine the two and multiply by our factor right here. All right, so um, if we do that, then you'll see the result is this. So we'll write down here is the final result for the gradient or affine coordinates. Now, one thing you can always do with affine coordinates to, to double check your results is to set the parameters such that uh, you're really dealing with Cartesian coordinates. So let's set the scaling factors to 1, so a and b to 1, and alpha equal to pi over 2, 90 degrees. If we do that, then we're really dealing with Cartesian coordinates. So this factor, a, b, sine, alpha, is just going to be equal to 1. We've got a is 1, b is 1, sine squared of pi over 2 is 1. So that's just a factor of 1. b is going to be 1. Cosine of alpha is going to be 0, because cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so that knocks this term out too. This is a 1. So 
in the end, the only things that remain are this, the basis vector, this, and the basis vector. So uh, the affine coordinates will reduce to Cartesian coordinates if we set a to 1, b to 1, and alpha equal to pi over 2. That's a little double check that you can always do to see if you've got the correct results. Okay, let's move on then to plane polar coordinates. Here our life gets a whole lot easier because uh, we have uh, an orthogonal system. That means that the only thing we have here are diagonal elements in our contravariant metric tensor. So instead of having to deal with four terms, we're only dealing with two. We're only interested in the components of our contravariant uh, metric tensor in which i and j are equal to each other. So we deal with z11 and z22, and that's going to be it. So um, let's walk through it. When i is 1 and j is 1, what we're going to have is a factor of 1 times the partial derivative of our function with respect to z1, which in uh, plane polar coordinates is r, and uh, then times our basis vector, z1. And that's our first term. Second term will be z22, which is 1 over r squared, times the partial derivative of f with respect to z2, which is our variable theta, times our covariant uh, basis vector z2. And the result is that easy. That is the result in plane polar coordinates. And here's the result right down here. Okay, the other thing we want to do is we want to normalize this. Uh, remember that z1 and z2 are not necessarily unit vectors. And to normalize it, we want to express it in a form where the basis vectors are also unit vectors. So let's remind ourselves that z1 is a basis uh, a unit vector and it's equal to the unit vector r hat. But z2 is not a unit vector. If you remember, that is a, a vector that has a magnitude equal to the radius. So z2 is really equal to r times theta hat, where theta hat is our unit vector. OK, so now what we want to do uh, to normalize this, we want to replace this with r hat. And we'll replace this with r theta hat, like that. And of course, when we do this factor of r, we'll cancel out one of these, giving us this result. So it looks very similar, but uh, here we have a factor of 1 over r instead of 1 over r squared. OK, now remember that uh, expressing it in a normalized uh, uh, form like this, that our basis vectors r hat and theta hat are unit vectors but they're um, not uh, basis vectors in the sense of tensor calculus. So this is not a tensor equation anymore, but it's the form that most people recognize when they talk about the gradient in plane polar coordinates. OK, let's move on to cylindrical polar coordinates. Now here it's the same drill as before. Because we have an orthogonal system, we simply run through the elements in the diagonal of our contravariant metric tensor like this. So the results are quite straightforward. We have a factor of 1 times the partial derivative of our function with respect to z1, which is rho in this case. And then that times our basis vector z1. Then we have 1 over rho squared. times the partial derivative of f with respect to z2, which in this case is phi, and that times z2. Then we have a factor of 1 times the partial derivative of f with respect to z3, which in this case is z, times our third covariant basis vector. And that's our result. So it looks just like this.
All right, now to normalize it, we do the same kind of thing we did before. Z1 is equal to rho hat. It is a unit vector. Z2 is not a unit vector. It's equal to rho times phi hat. And then Z3 is uh, a unit vector equal to Z hat. So the only thing that we're going to have to do here is uh, we'll replace each of these with uh, rho hat and z hat. But here we replace z2 with rho phi hat. And that's going to kill one of these factors of rho like this. So our normalized form looks almost identical except that this factor is 1 over rho instead of 1 over rho squared. Okay, um, and finally, let's look at spherical polar coordinates. All right, again, we're dealing with an orthogonal system, so we simply need to walk down the diagonal of our contravariant metric tensor and form the necessary uh, factors. So we'll start with the uh, first one is 1 times the partial derivative of f with respect to z1, which is r, times our first basis vector. And the second term is 1 over r squared times the partial of f with respect to our uh, z2, which is theta, times our second basis vector. And the last term is 1 over r squared sine squared theta. times the partial of f with respect to z3, which is phi, times our third basis vector. And that's our result. And you see it right down here. OK, now to normalize it, we know that uh, z1 is equal to r hat. Z2 is equal to r theta hat. And Z3 is equal to r sine theta phi hat. So making each of those substitutions right over here, 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 and here, the result is going to look like that. We're going to lose a factor of r here and a factor of r sine theta there, giving us this result. And uh, so those are the uh, results for spherical polar coordinates. And with that, you now see what the gradient looks like in each of our sample coordinate systems.